morning, Parker Road. Glad to see all of you here this morning. Let's stand and worship our Lord together. To the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. God is with us forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. By the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. His love in yours forever. Please be seated. Good morning, Parker Road. Great to see you and beautiful day. Glad you're here. My name is Randy James. Uh, we want to thank you for spending the morning with us. On the back of the chair in front of you, you'll see connection cards for those of you who are Normally with us, you know what those are about. For those of you who are visiting, all that we ask today is that you uh, fill that out a little bit for us and let, let us know how we can serve you better and pray for you and, and any needs that you may have. Um, in terms of a visitor's gift, for those of you who are here for the first time, we have visitor's gifts for our, for our newcomers. If you didn't get one on the way in, please stop at the welcome desk on the way out to make sure to get that. Uh, let's see, and the Women's Connection will host a get-together on Saturday, April 20th. That's this coming Saturday from 10 to 12 here at PRBC, Parker Road Bible Church. All women are welcome to attend, and please see Mary DeVries for more information. I don't think Mary's here right now. No. On May 5th, that's the next men's breakfast. Is that May 5th or May 4th? It's on a Saturday, but anyway. Um, it's the 4th, thank you. It's May 4th. Uh, the men's breakfast will be welcoming back Navy SEAL Commander Michael Imhoff. And we encourage all men to attend and join us. That's uh, for 12 and over. And if you want to bring your small children, please let us know ahead of time. And we will make sure to provide child care for you. So thank you for that. As always, there's a lot more happening here at PRBC that we don't want to do announcements and waste time from the Word. So please check your bulletins for all that's um, upcoming. And at this time, we would typically do our offering. 
and we will do our offering and offering prayer. We have baskets by the doors. We have easy tithe on the app. Welcome to you, Facebook, by the way. That was rude of me not to welcome you as well. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is just uh, such a blessing to be here uh, in, your, in your house today. Lord, we pray that you just help us to, to serve you in any way that you have allowed us to, to do so, whether it be financially or human resources or, or just working with and for one another. Lord, let us glorify you in all that we do and however we can. We thank you again that everyone's here. There is not one here, Lord, that you have been placed here today and for specific reasons. So we, we just praise you for all that have entered the church here today, your house. May we all open our hearts. May you be with Pastor Frank as he teaches your word along with all the other pastors this morning. Let them speak in truth and in love and in the grace that only you can provide. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we continue our service and worship. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. My song join the one that never ends because he lives. I was dead in the grave, I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. My song join the one that never ends because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives every fear is gone I know he holds my life my future in his end Amen, amen, I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives, amen, amen, let my song join the one that never ends, amen, amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends because he lives. Because he lives.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you there is none besides you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and holy there is no one like you there is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build. Upon your love, it is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken and holy, there is no one like you. 
and holy. There is no one like you. There is none besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands has made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great thou art and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Please remain standing for scripture reading. Children ages 3 to 6th grade are dismissed for Children's Church. Good morning, church family. Our reading this morning is Judges 14, 1 through 7. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among 
all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At the time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came toward, toward him roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you today. Good to worship together. Wanted to welcome you if you're visiting today. Uh, we appreciate you choosing to be here at PRBC and worship with us. As Randy mentioned, there are those uh, connection cards in the seat in front of you. If you could fill that out, drop it either in the offering basket or the one in box in the back on your way out. We would greatly appreciate that, and that's the only thing that we ask of you today. We want to welcome those who are online with us as well. Thank you for joining us, and of course, those who are uh, regular here at PRBC um, and part of this church, great to have you as well. And so, um, I wanted to go to the Lord in prayer. Um, a couple things just, just I wanted to mention. Um, the men's breakfast on, is, is May 4th. And there's a card um, that men can use to share that with other men if you want to invite them out. Uh, we do ask you to um, sign up for this one just to help uh, figure out how much food needs to be purchased and so on. Um, it's a free event, so um, we'd love to have you here for that on May 4th. And then uh, one other uh, item I wanted to mention is baptism. We'd like to have baptisms um, April, or I'm sorry, yeah, April 28th. So um, that would be uh, towards the end of the service on April 28th. If you have not been baptized, if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have not publicly declared that or proclaimed that with baptism, um, and you would like to, please contact me and uh, we'll talk about it and, and get you on the schedule to be baptized. If you have questions about baptism, you're not sure really what it is or the difference between here and maybe other uh, churches you've been to or whatnot, feel free to contact me, contact the church office, um, and, and we'll, we'd love to talk with you more about baptism. And so with that being said, let's bow our heads, let's go into prayer, and then we'll get back into judges. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and graciousness, Lord God. We thank you that you are a God who is perfect, a God who is just, a God who is holy, a God who is righteous. You are a God worth worshiping. You are a God that is so far beyond us, yet you are a God who has revealed yourself to us. You are a God who um, is infinite, and yet you have made it so that us as finite creations of yours could know you. And Lord God, that's, uh, we are so grateful for that. Lord, we're so grateful that as your creation, that, um, that we could see who you are in creation, Lord God. Just the fact that, that we look out the door and see flowers blooming and trees uh, with buds on them. And, and we see the grass growing and we see the, the stars in the heavens and we see the um, sun and, and the moon and so on, Lord God. It's evidence of who you are. Your word says that the heavens declare your glory. Lord, the fact that, that in our minds, Lord God, um, that we are, our consciences do point to what's right and wrong, Lord God. Um, it re, it's a revelation of who you are, the way you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, through your word, Lord, your perfect word that the prophets and the apostles wrote, guided by your Holy Spirit, we're so glad that we have that, Lord God, that we can know who you are through your word. And Lord God, I thank you for the greatest of all revelation, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for him. We thank you so much that you loved us so much that even though you were perfectly just and righteous, 
And we have fallen so short of your glory, even though we deserve to have your wrath upon us, that you sent a way for us to be forgiven. You sent a way for us to be washed clean. You sent a way for us to have a new heart. You sent a way for us to be born again. You sent a way for us to live eternally. You sent a way for us to live abundantly. And we are so grateful that that way is our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for what he's done for us, that he was willing to leave the glory of heaven, to live a perfect life, to be the perfect substitute, dying on the cross for our sins, buried on the third day. He rose again. He lives today. After he ascended into heaven, he's seated at your right hand. And we thank you that he intercedes for us even now. We want to bring him glory today, Lord God. We want him to be honored. This is his church that he bought with his blood. We want him to be glorified. Lord God, we want you to be worshipped and lifted up, Lord God. Lord, we want your Holy Spirit to have his way amongst us today. We pray that he would work powerfully in each one of us, Lord God. Lord God, for those who don't know you yet, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would work with power on their hearts and draw them to you, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you bless those who are hurting today, those who are discouraged, those who are depressed, those who are struggling with um, financial issues, those who are struggling with health. Pray you meet each one right where they're at, Lord God. Lord, I pray for those who are mourning, that you'd comfort them. I pray uh, for those who don't know where to turn, Lord God, that they would turn to you today. We pray for, again, for each one here. We pray for those online. We pray for our community, Lord God. I pray that you would use this church in, in our community, that you would help us to reach out to those who need you. So again, I thank you for each one here. We lift this all up in the name above all names, in the name of the one who did give his very life for us, is risen and alive. It's in his mighty and wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in chapter 13, we read about a, a miraculous birth announcement. And the angel of the Lord met a woman. And that woman will come to know as Samson's mother. In fact, we talked about her last week. And the angel of the Lord also met Samson's father, Manoah, when he cried out to God to, to have that information confirmed. And so it, uh, the angel of the Lord had announced this birth. This birth would be, um, Samson would be born. He would be consecrated to the Lord. He'd be one who was set apart for the Lord, one who was to be devoted to the Lord uh, by his parents as a child, and then um, that he would be devoted as an adult. He was born to faithful, praying parents. He was uh, to be the deliverer of Israel. He was to come about by a miracle of God. So all these things set us up for really a story of where you would think Samson is going to be this great deliverer, maybe the greatest of all the judges that we've seen so far. That Samson is going to be this wonderful man, again, dedicated to the Lord, has the blessing of two parents who love him and want to follow God and, and pray for him and care for him. And he, he's got all these things that, that have lined him up to be this great judge. And then um, we come to chapter 14. And we're not prepared for what we come to in chapter 14. Samson is much different than we would expect him to be. We encounter a selfish, egotistical, lustful, angry, avenging loner. It's not what we expect, is it? The amazing thing is this. In seeing that and seeing who Samson is over the next three chapters, today we're going to look at two, Samson, in all of his depravity, is still used by God. God still empowers him to begin the deliverance of his people Israel. 
So as we look at this, what do we learn about human flaws? What do we learn about the ability of God to accomplish his will in spite of our flaws? We see these things in uh, Judges chapter 14 and 15. So I want to I want to pick up actually the last verse in 13, and then we'll go ahead and move through um, the different scenes of 14 and 15. So let's look at Judges chapter 13, verse 25. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahanadan between Zorah and Ashtaol. And so this is Samson, right? The Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. There's something different about Samson, and it's the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him, stirring him, working in his life. We'll see over and over in this passage, um, we'll see a number of times where it said that the Spirit rushed upon him. And so we see the Spirit moving in the life of Samson. Again, as we look at this, it's kind of like, Really, is the Spirit going to use someone like Samson? Is God going to use someone like Samson? Well, he does. He does. So let's look at verse 1. Okay, verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now again, Samson, he was going to be the guy who does what? Who begins to deliver Israel from the Philistines. So Samson, that's what he was going to do. He, he had the Nazarite vow. That's what they instructed. The angel of the Lord instructed him, right? To take the Nazarite vow. I believe the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ that met him in the midst of that situation, and he told him, um, basically, to de- he told his parents to devote him to the Lord. And so the Nazarite vow was, you don't touch anything that's dead, you don't drink anything off the vine, especially uh, anything uh, as far as strong drink, any kind of alcohol, any kind of wine, and he does, he's not supposed to cut his hair. So that's the Nazarite vow. Their outer um, commitments or or visible uh, commitments that he makes that should reflect what's going on inside him and his devotion to the Lord. And so he is supposed to be a man who's devoted to the Lord. And here he wants this girl who is devoted to Dagon, the, the god of the Philistines. He's supposed to deliver the Israel, the Israelites from Philistine control. They were under oppression from the Philistines. And instead of delivering them, he wants to marry one of them. And so you can imagine his mother and father's dismay when this happens. Now Samson, he, he says, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. So back in that day, and that may sound, uh, it it sounds off to us today, but in that day it really would have sounded off to them because the father and the mother would have been the ones who chose the wife for the child, the father specifically. And so for him to go to his dad and say, no, I don't care about who you choose. I'm choosing her. She's the one I want. And... uh, how many of you remember the old uh, Willy Wonka? I, I never saw the new one, but there's the old Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, right? With Gene Wilder, you re- re- remember that movie? There was this girl, Veruca Salt, and she would go with Willy. Her dad was with her, and she was with the group that got the, the golden wrapper and was touring the Chocolate Factory. And Veruca Salt, everything she would see, she wanted it, Right? Like, I want that. Get it for me, Daddy. And as I read Samson's words here, I'm like, her, her voice echoes in my mind. You know, this little spoiled girl. I want that, Daddy. Get it for me. 
and we see the kind of guy Samson is already. He wants that girl, so he needs that girl. He's very impulsive. He sees her. He likes the way she looks. So dad, get her for me. Now his mom and dad, his father and mother, say to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all of our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? Now that was a derogatory term against them, and the issue was, um, was not ethnically that she was a Philistine. In fact, the book that comes after Judges is what? Ruth, Right? So you got Ruth, and she's a Moabite. She's not a Jew. But here's the difference with Ruth. She trusted in the God of Israel. She trusted in Yahweh. And she is actually in the lineage of Christ. Um, so you see that. So the issue here is, is really not that she's a Philistine, but she's part of the Philistines that are oppressing the Israelites and that worship a false god. And so his parents are like, can't you pick somebody? Like, we, you're the one who's been devoted to the Lord. You're one the one who's going to deliver the Philistines. And instead you want to marry this girl? Like, can't you find anybody else, Samson? Nope, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. And so Samson, he just puts down his, his foot. He's like the little kid in the grocery store throwing the tantrum. He wants the candy bar, right? Or he wants the toy. And he's going to stomp his feet, and he's going to cry, and he's going to make it throw a tantrum till he gets what he wants. And so, we're let into something here. Well, before we even get to that, it's very interesting, the terminology here and how this is written. Samson says, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. She is right in my eyes. Now, if you go through the book of Judges, what do you see? Israel did what? Yeah, what was right in their own eyes and what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so Samson here is not like, all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? I really like this girl. What do you, Lord, what do you want me to do? Go to his parents. I really want to follow the Lord, and so this is the situation I'm in. No, he's like, I want her. She's right in my eyes. And that's, a char that's characteristic of the Israelites throughout the book of Judges, isn't it? In fact, it's characteristic of the Israelites throughout the Old Testament, we see. In fact, it's characteristic of our human nature, isn't it? That oftentimes when we want something, we want it because it looks good in our eyes. Are we taking that step, to, that step back and saying, okay, I really like this person or I really like this thing, or I really like this job, or I really like this opportunity, or I really like whatever, but what do you, what do you want me to do, Lord? How do you want me to walk? Because I care about what's right in your eyes more than what's right in my own eyes. So Samson, he's not, he's not there. And here's the, the, the irony. Let me mention this. As we, as we move into the next verse, when we care more for what is right in our own eyes than God's eyes, then there are inevitable consequences and much pain. So before we even get into the next verse, just look at what Samson is doing. He is setting himself up for failure. He is setting himself up to reap the consequences of his decision against the Lord. Whenever we move outside of the design of the Lord, it leads to destruction. There are inevitable consequences of rejecting what's right in God's eyes and doing what's right in our eyes, even if it contradicts what's right in God's eyes. Along with those consequences, always goes pain. 
pain always follows. And so pain isn't always a result of sin, but sin always brings about ultimately pain. And so we see that there, Samson, he's into what's right. He, he's into what he wants, what's right in his own eyes. Now we're led into something that's, that is really one of those things that's kind of mind-blowing as we look at it. So let's look at verse 4 here. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So some people have said, well, the, he, is, he was um, looking for an opportunity. Well, maybe that Samson was looking for an opportunity. And maybe he really had a good, good intentions. But we read through the rest of the story, and we don't see Samson looking for an opportunity. We see Samson as really kind of an unhinged guy. A guy who is impulsive. He sees something, he wants it, he takes it, or he demands it. We see that he's somebody who's vengeful. Things happen to him, so he's going to get revenge. We see somebody who is um, really about his own, about what he desires to do, what's right in his own eyes in a lot of ways. And so the opportunity here is the opportunity that the Lord is going to use. And that's really um, something, again, it's a mind-blowing thing that God is going to use this decision, this sinful decision that Samson makes to bring about good. To bring, to, to, he's going to use this harmful thing to bring about glory. And it really speaks to the sovereignty of God, that he is in control of all things, that he is powerful, that nothing is beyond his sovereign rule. So God is not limited in who he uses to accomplish his purposes. And he'll take the opportunity to accomplish his will even when we're out of it. Do you know that? He uses this situation, he uses situations throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Scripture, to accomplish things through people that were on their own program. But he's stronger. There's none like him. There's none that can stand against him. He is sovereign. He is in control. At one level, it's kind of troubling that God will use this. But he's beyond us. He's beyond us. In fact, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. He is so far beyond us. So he's going to use this situation of Samson's disobedience here. He's going to use it for, to accomplish his will. It's troubling, but at the same time, there's a realization that even when we mess up, even those things we regret, that God can still work in the midst of those situations. That God can still use those things intended for harm for good. Arthur Lewis said this, he said, The sovereign God can turn our decisions to fulfill his ends, even when we make them in transgression of his laws of holiness. Pharaoh freely determined to enslave the Hebrew tribes in Egypt, yet the Bible states God hardened his heart to do this. Rehoboam made a bad choice when he said he would add even heavier taxes on the northern tribes, yet we read it was a turn of events from the Lord that he might establish his word. In the same manner, we may conclude that Samson's, decisions, Samson's decision was a wrong one, yet it was allowed by God and ordained to accomplish an initial victory over the enemies of God's people. Somehow God was going to carry out his will in the middle of the mess 
that was Samson's life. God carries out his will in the middle of the mess that is our lives. Praise God. I think of the sovereignty of God, and I think about the, the, um, the idea of the, the rugs, how the rugs were woven, and I, I've mentioned this uh, previously, but um, they used to build the, these big, huge, like, oriental-type rugs in two-story buildings. And they would um, build it, and you could see that it was being woven together, but you could see the underside. And the underside of the rug is just a bunch of strings, and it looks like a big mess. Looks like a big mess of different strings going haphazardly all over the place. If you looked at that and you're like, that's the rug, you would think like, that's, that's horrible. That's really, it's nothing I'd want to buy. But then from the second floor, looking down, you would see the rug from the top. And it would be a beautifully woven rug. So reality on earth, we look at things, we look at our own lives, we look at the lives of others, we look at the things that have happened to us, we look at the things that we've done to others, and you look and you see just this haphazard bunch of strings going back and forth, and you're like, what is that? But then from the top, from the top looking down, God is doing something. He's weaving together the tapestry. Corey Ten Boom talked about this, and she was, remember, the Dutch girl that helped, uh, that helped save Jews during uh, World War II from the Nazis. And this picture here, she would actually um, bring this uh, picture when she would speak, and you look on the one side, on this left side here, you see just that, I mean, that looks like a mess, doesn't it? Just all those strings. Um, and that's, life sometimes looks like that, doesn't it? But the reality is God is doing something. And she would flip it over and then show the other side. In fact, there's a, a poem, as, as much as I could gather, it was written by somebody named Grant Tuller Colfax. And this is what he wrote. He said, my life is but a weaving between God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful as the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. It's a re reality that in the middle of our messes that God is working. Samson, as we pick up on his story here. I'll put that back up because I know some who follow along in the bulletin will be after me afterwards. I, I appreciate that you do take notes and follow along for those who do, for sure. But God is not limited in who he uses to accomplish his purposes. He'll take the opportunity to accomplish his will even when we're out of it, right? So verse 5. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came towards him roaring, then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hands, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes, right? So this thing, this situation, he wrestles this lion and he kills this lion. And it's like, come on, how could this even happen? Well, we read how it could happen. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. The lion attacked Samson. Samson is able to overcome the lion. Why? Because God's power was upon him. Normally a man can't, can't overcome a lion. 
We read stories of hikers and, and cyclists being um, mauled by, uh, by cougars as they're riding down trails or walking down trails. I remember there was a, a guy who was studying in, in one of the cities in India when I was there years ago, and uh, I was talking to him about where he came from, and he came from an island, and in that island there were still, uh, they still feared tigers because the tigers would actually go into the villages and eat the people. And so you look at this, it's like, no way, no way could Samson take out this lion. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. It was miraculous. It was miraculous. We're going to see the things that Samson does are miraculous. Again, God still chooses to use him even in spite of his flaws. And he takes out this, this lion. You wonder why, why God allowed him to take out this lion? Maybe to some level it would give him confidence of what he'd be able to do later on. On the other end, it leads to the next step as the story unfolds. That out of this situation is going to come another situation where he proposes a riddle. And so, let's go ahead and move on. After some days... He returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. So he's going back the same way, um, in, in general the same way, but he turns back, so he wants to go see that lion, where he killed that lion. So he goes back, and behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and the honey. So in that hot Middle Eastern sun, we don't know how much long, how much after this, how much after he initially killed the lion that this actually is. Um, the, the hot Middle Eastern sun is beating down and drying out the lion's carcass. Probably have some fur and some, the skeletal system there. And these bees figure, hey, that's a good place to build a beehive. Unfortunately, we find out every spring that the shed out here is a good place for the bees and the wasps to build hives. So they find certain places and they just begin to build them. And so Samson sees that and he scrapes out, the hand, scrapes out into his hands and went on eating as he went. Now remember, he has the Nazarite vow, right? What are the parts of the Nazarite vow? You're not supposed to drink any wine, you're not supposed to cut your hair, and you're not supposed to touch anything that's dead. But Samson scrapes out the honey out of inside the lion. He was eating as he went. He came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate, but, they did not, but he did not tell them that he scraped the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Why not? Because he was breaking his vow. I think there's a reality, too, as far as how sin works. You know, sin works with this, these selfish desires that are upon us, that works through impulsiveness, right? To where we see something we want, so we just go and take it, or drink it, or eat it, or buy it, or whatever. And it's a gradual process in a lot of ways. You know, somebody who's... Uh, you know, on this uh, homeless and, and addicted to some sort of substance doesn't start out by saying, I want to be homeless and addicted to a substance. Little by little, things happen, don't they? And little by little, compromises happen. And so Samson, again, in spite of Samson's disobedience, God is going to use this. So we go to verse 10. So his father went down to, uh, to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there for the young men. To uh, young men, for so the young men used to do. And so he prepared a feast. It's basically what it's called is it really, if you go back to the the Hebrew language, it's a drinking party. It's like this big feast. There's going to be alcohol there. It's going to be the the wedding party, is what he's setting up. This big party. Um, and 
So he's setting it up, and as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. So why did they do it? Oh, the Philistines are so sweet, aren't they? They see Samson all by himself, and they're like, he needs some buddies. He needs some friends. So let's get 30 guys to go hang out with him. The Philistines are so nice, aren't they? Now the reality is that, that they, they see Samson. They, they know there's something about Samson to some degree. At least I surmise this. And they have these 30 guys because he's an Israelite. And he's marrying this Philistine girl. And they don't know how much to, they don't know how to take Samson. They have these 30 guys, and these 30 guys, um, we'll see what happens here. Now, Samson, he puts a riddle to him. So one of the things we're going to see about Samson is he has a level of arrogance. So he's going to put a riddle. He says, let me, get, let me put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within seven days of the feast and find out, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. And so it's like the linen garments would be like really nice underwear, basically. Really nice undergarments. And then the robes would be like buying them suits. You know, expensive suits or a tuxedo or something like that. It's like formal wear. And so he's like, if you can get the r riddle, then I'll buy all you guys some really nice new underwear and some, a new tuxedo or a new suit. But if you can't get the riddle, you guys all have to buy me one, 30 of them for me. So you can see Samson, he's like, hey, 30 for himself, that's, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Because Samson is like, how are they going to know this riddle? So Samson said to them, or they said to Samson, all right, we'll take you on. Put, it, put your riddle so that we may hear it. This was common. They would tell riddles in that day and age and entertain through the riddles. Samson said this. He said, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. So Samson, is, he knows out of the eater came something to eat. Who's the eater? The lion, right? And out of the strong came something sweet. It was out of that lion that the bees put the honey, and the honey was sweet. And so it's like Samson killed the lion. He was by himself when he did this. How are they ever going to know this? How are they going to know this? Now some guys have said, well, this, they should have been able to know this and this and that. I'm like, I don't think there's any way they ever would have known this. And I think that's why Samson did this. Because he's like, there's no way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hustle these guys. I'm going to take these guys. You know, they want to go send all these guys to get up in my business. They want to send these guys to, to keep an eye on me, to spy on me. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take their money. Because they're going to have to buy me all this stuff. And so on the fourth day, they can't figure this thing out. So on the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you in your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? So fire, we see fire. We'll see that over uh, a few times in this passage. And so they said, we're going to burn you to death. I mean, that's pretty intense, isn't it? Have you invited us here to, to impoverish us, for us to go broke? Now, they just had to get one. Samson would have had to get 30 if he lost the bet. But Samson's wife, she's afraid. And so she's afraid. And so instead of telling Samson, she's just weeping and she's weeping. And she starts to manipulate him in order to try to get the information. You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put a riddle to my people and you have not told me what it is. So he doesn't, she doesn't tell him the real story. She actually betrays him here. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? 
And she wept before him seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day he told her because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. So she's crying and crying. So he sees this girl. He really likes her. He wants her. He tells his parents, get her for me. He ends up going and and having this Philistine girl that's betrothed to him. They're having the wedding feast on the night that um, the consummation was on the seventh night. So they go this whole time. She's bawling the whole time. You can imagine, like, he's got some buyer's remorse going on right now, right? She's just crying and crying and, uh, and so he's like, oh, forget it. And he tells her. And of course, she goes and tells the man. And so the man of the city said to him, on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you have not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. I'll give all the husbands here some advice. (laughs) The men here, young men who will be married one day. There's application throughout the scripture that we're instructed to do, right? Prescriptive stuff. The Bible tells us to do it. Then there's descriptive stuff. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. Don't call your wife a heifer, or you have serious issues, right? But anyway, um, the heifer, it it dealt really with her stubbornness, how stubborn she was, because she kept crying and crying and crying. And so he's like, if you didn't go to my wife and you weren't putting the pressure on her, then you would have never known this. Like, you guys, man, you, you were dirty in how you found this out. And so this is how Samson responds. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. So he goes down to 30 he goes down to Ashkelon to the city there and he kills 30 guys, takes their clothes and their underwear and goes and brings them and gives them to the other 30 guys to pay off his bet. You're like, this is wild stuff, isn't it? This is some violent stuff. Here's the thing. In verse 19, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. He was empowered by God to do this. Now remember, the Philistines are mortal enemies of the Israelites. Some way and somehow God had this part of his plan in order to overthrow the Israelites. Now Samson wouldn't overthrow them completely, but he would begin to overthrow them. He would begin to overthrow them. Now Samson, he goes, kills these guys, takes their clothes, pays off his bat, and then it says this, in hot anger he went back to his father's house. So he is so mad at this girl. Remember, he really wanted her. He's impulsive. But at the same time, Samson's, the, like Samson's favorite person in the world, right? And she just did this to him, and he's so mad at her. So he goes home, and he doesn't go back there. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. Again, these are the guys, right, that, that have been provided by the Philistines. And the father's like, oh, well, Samson's gone. I'll give her to the best man. He probably didn't want her marrying some lowly oppressed Israelite. One way or another, he gives her um, he gives her to the best man. And if you think the 30 guys being slaughtered and stripped down and their clothes being taken is bad, it gets more intense as we go on. Verse 1 uh, of chapter 15. And after some time, at the, after some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go in to my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. 
And her father, so he comes and he has the, he has the goat. He's basically bringing her dinner, right? That's how they bring him dinner back then. Got a young goat. He's going in. He's going to go see his wife. But her father wouldn't allow him in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. So I'm sorry I gave your wife away, but, but you can have her, her kid sister. And so that's what this guy throws out there. Um, now Samson said, um, I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. He is so upset. He's betrayed by this girl when she let, gave the, the um, riddle, answer to the riddle away. He was betrayed by her father when uh, his, her father gives her away. And he's, he was hot with anger before, now he's really hot. And so he does this, this situation, he sets this thing up that's like, in one level, it's ingenious. In another level, it's like crazy. And he sets up a situation to get back. And this is what he does. Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Those are probably either foxes or jackals. Uh, very similar words there for them. Or, or it's the same word used for both. Took torches. Um, and he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. Now, this is not PETA approved, right? He takes, it's just crazy how he sets this up, and we don't know how long it takes him to do this, but he lines up this plot. When he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing uh, grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stack grains and the standing grains as well as the olive orchards. So he has like a torch, that he ties to the tails of these dogs, what foxes or jackals. He eventually lights them and sends them out, and they go out and they set fire to the whole place. They set fire to the whole place and burn the whole place. Um, they burn the stacked grain, the standing grain, as well of, uh, as well as the olive orchards. So they burn everything during that time. Then the Philistines. Now, one other thing is Dagon is actually the god of grain, the god of the, the crops. And so um, it's just a total affront to the Philistines. And so the Philistines say, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And so they know that it's Samson. So the Philistines, you know what the Philistines do? They come up and they burn the family. They end up doing the same thing she was afraid of with the riddle actually is what happens to her and what happens to her father. The Philistines come back and burn her and her father. It's a brutal situation, isn't it? And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be, I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock of Edom. And so what happens here? He strikes them with hip and thigh, what does that mean? It's a vicious attack. He viciously attacked the people who were responsible for this and killed them. And so he's like, all right, I'm going to do this, and then I'm done. That's a reality with sin, too. Specifically when it comes to revenge. We think, oh, well, we'll do this, and it will just end. Then we'll stop. But it doesn't. It just goes on and on and on. Sin, oh, I'll just do this a little bit and then I'll stop. Goes on and on. And so, verse 9. 
Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? So they had oppressed them, but it was, they were oppressing them, but they were living under their, uh, under their um, rule. But here now they attack them, and they wonder what provoked this attack. So the men of Judah say, why did you attack us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is that you have done to us? And so here's the thing. This is Judah, right? It's one of the 12 tribes. Samson was from the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes. It's like, okay, Samson is going to deliver Israel from the Philistines, right? So isn't this a moment to where, like, if we would think back to Gideon, or we would think back to Deborah and Barak, or, or Ehud, or we think to Othniel, we think to these other judges, even Jephthah, Isn't this one of those situations to where this is the time, it's go time. Samson now is going to lead Judah against the Philistines, and they're going to overtake them. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens. uh, He said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. So he just justifies his action, and then they say to him, we have come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. So he was betrayed by his wife, he was betrayed by her father, and now he's betrayed by his own people. The interesting thing is Samson did things which put him into these positions. Yet at the same time, things then begin to happen to him. And we see that when we play with fire, we get burned. When we play with sin, it leads us to harming others and others harming us. It leads to consequences like betrayal and loneliness. Again, every time you're betrayed, it's not because of sin. Maybe you're lonely today and it's not because of your sin. But sin will often lead to betrayal and loneliness. You even think of the the young son, and we fast forward to the New Testament, to the prodigal son. What's he end up doing? Sitting in the pig pen by himself. He had all these friends. He had big parties when he had all this money. After he had sinned against his father and turned against his father, he had all this money, had big parties, but what does he end up? Slopping pigs all by himself. And Samson is in this situation where he's betrayed again by his own people. They said they want to bind him. Samson says to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, The Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Now the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him when he defeated the lion. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him when he defeated the 30 men in Ashkelon. The Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him now. And so he destroyed the lion. He destroyed those 30 men. What do you expect to happen now? He's going to do something. And so um, the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that had caught fire again. There's fire again, isn't it? We see that again. And his bonds melted off his hands, and he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he put out his hand and took it. This is what a jawbone of a donkey looks like, being the fact that it was fresh as it wasn't there for 20 years laying there all brittle like bone can sometimes get. It was fresh, meaning that it had some sort of some type of durability left in it, some sort of uh, freshness to it, some sort of flexibility in it. And so he grabs this thing, and he struck one thousand men. He killed one thousand men 
with this jawbone. And again, people are like, how could this happen? Samson can't kill a thousand. It was the power of God upon him. It was a miraculous situation where God was using him to begin to deliver the Philistines. And so he, he goes nuts on them, right? He kills a thousand. We don't know how. He was in a cave at one point. They had him tied up probably towards this cleft. Is he going from, you know, I'm thinking through this. I wonder how this actually transpired. I'm sure it wasn't like a thousand rush and he's just hitting them. You know, so you see those old Bruce Lee movies and one guy at a time is attacking them, right? The other guys just stand there and wait till Bruce Lee beats up the one guy, then the next guy comes. Like, how did this happen? You know, is he going from cave to cave and are they coming in? And is he attacking them and killing them? And is he killing them and running? Is he moving? I don't know. I don't know. We know it's miraculous what happened, though. And he kills all these men. And it's part of what God had designed to occur because he was going to overcome the Philistines. He was going to begin to overcome the Philistines. Remember, the Israel, Israelites are under the oppression of the Philistines. They have been worshiping the gods of the land. And God says, they are a people for me, a people for myself, not to worship these other gods. And so he's going to use Samson to deliver them. So verse 18, the battle is over now. And he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, You have granted this, sal this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and I shall now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. And God split up the hollow place that is at Lehi and water came out from it and when he drank his spirit returned and he revived and so Samson here this is really the one of only two prayers we see Samson pray we'll see the next one next week but in this moment he prays and when you look at his prayer it doesn't actually look like the prayer of a very mature person does it God you gave me this great victory and now I'm going to die of thirst? Come on, God. That's Samson's prayer. Like, doesn't he recognize who he's dealing with? In the midst of it all, this spoiled guy, egotistical guy, vengeful guy, violent guy, in the midst of it all, God meets him where he's at, and he breaks the stone, and water comes out of the rock. And Samson is thirsty, and God provides. And that's the reality. From the beginning, if Samson would have looked to have satisfy his thirst in God, God would have provided. But Samson took things in his own hands. He went his own way. God worked in spite of it. But what could it have been? The, therefore, the name of it was called uh, An Hakor. It is at Lehi today. What does that mean? The place where Samson's strength was restored was still at the time of the writing called An Hakor, which means the spring of the caller. Now, I'm so grateful that God, at the times where I prayed selfish prayers, where I was at a point where I thought that he should have done something for me and it didn't happen. So I'm like, come on, God, what are you doing? And yet in his graciousness and his mercy, he still met me. He is such a good and gracious God. We are so undeserving. We are only deserving of hell. And yet he pours his grace upon us. And this is verse 20. I'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 20. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. God would use him to judge Israel for 20 years. This, this guy, I mean, it's like, what? This is the guy you use, God? Yeah, this is the guy he uses. He uses flawed people. 
Again, it's troubling to some level, but on the other level, it's encouraging because guess what? We're all flawed people. We're all flawed people. Ultimately, our thirst should lead us to God because he's the only one that can sustain us and empower us with his spirit. See, why was Samson successful? It was because of the power of God's spirit. He was, um, it was only because of God and what he did that he was, that Samson was able to accomplish what he accomplished. Our thirst, it should not lead us. When we want something, it shouldn't lead us to just demanding it. It shouldn't lead us to throwing a tantrum. It should lead us to God, to seek, to fulfill that thirst in the way he desires. In fact, you know what sin is? It's fulfilling a need, a legitimate need, in a way other than what God designed for it to be filled. I want to finish with this Isaiah chapter 55. I had read a portion of it that many of us know. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. So I want to start with 55 verse 1. This is what Isaiah writes. He says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader to the, uh, and commander of the peoples. Behold, you shall call uh, a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. I want you to hear this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are uh, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you thirst? Come everyone who thirsts to the waters. Come to the waters. Come to Christ. And receive it. I know there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in the news today. All kinds of wild stories. All kinds of different things. All kinds of uh, different events. Things as far as going on in, in the ecologically, wars going on, the situation with Iran and Israel recently, all these different things going on. The eclipse happened and people are like, oh, is this, is this the time God's going to come, that, that Christ's going to come? Is this the beginning of the tribulation or something like that? All these things are going on and people are wondering what's happening. What's happening? Different alliances are being uh, developed. Different technology that can do things that we can never imagine um, are happening, is, is being developed. And all these things are, are coming together. And people are like, okay, when is it going to happen? And this and that, and what should I do? And all this. But the reality is, is this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that the Lord may have compassion on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon. See, today is the day of salvation. 
We don't know when the end's going to come. We don't know when the time of the rapture is going to come. We don't know when the great tribulation is going to come. We don't know when these things are going to come. We don't know when our nation is going to be judged for all the wicked things that we've done. When God's, you know, God is like, all right, I've had enough. We don't know the answers to these different things. But what we do know today is today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation again. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Put your trust in Jesus Christ if you haven't. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried on the third day. He rose again. He lives today. Turn to him and trust him. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like he said, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. If you haven't trusted in him, make today the day. Make today the day. I think of all the sacrifices throughout the Old Testament. All the sacrifices through the Old Testament were a temporary sacrifice that pointed to the greatest sacrifice, Jesus, once and for all, on Calvary, as he would die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I think of these judges, and all these judges, they are temporary deliverers. Temporary deliverers that delivered just for a moment. But they point to the greatest of all deliverers, the Lord Jesus Christ, that delivers us from sin, that, that transfers us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom, his kingdom. We are delivered by the Father from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of the beloved Son because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross of Calvary, dying for our sins, taking our sin upon his shoulders. Taking God's wrath upon himself so that we wouldn't have to endure it for eternity. So that all who believe in him would have eternal life. Have you trusted in Jesus? If not, make today the day. He is the perfect deliverer. He is the one. You think it's amazing what Samson did with the foxes and with the thousand men and the jawbone and all the other things? Jesus Christ, once and for all, died on the cross, satisfied the wrath of God, defeated his enemies, rose from the dead, and he's alive today. What's even more amazing is that you and me, as flawed as we are, that if we call upon his name and put our trust in him, we are saved by his grace through faith. For those of us who know him, who have trusted in him. We still have thirst, don't we? We still need things. We still have temptation. Do we handle it like Samson? Or do we go to him for our thirst to be satisfied? And lastly this, just to keep aware that this life is messy. This life is like the underside of the, the carpet. This life is like the underside of that, that tapestry with the crown on it. It's a mess. There's all kinds of things going on in our lives, all types of things. Mistakes we made, mistakes others made, things that we sinfully did, things others have done to us. Situations we can't explain, and we wonder why they even happen. And in the midst of that all, the reality is that God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Church, we need to keep that in mind. That, keep that in mind. The tapestry may look like a mess from the bottom, but from the top, he's weaving something beautiful. And he who begin that good work in you will bring it unto completion. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Samson. It's a, it's a wild story, a violent story, Lord God. This, this fallen world is a violent world. Lord God, there's things you do in order to bring justice that blows us away. But we recognize and we admit that our ways are not your ways. And that your ways are higher than our ways. So, Lord God, we just want to submit to you. We just want to follow you. We want to seek you to fill our deepest needs, our deepest thirst. 
We don't want to fall into sin as Samson did. And at the same time, we're grateful that you use us even though we're flawed, just like Samson was. And Lord God, I pray that you'd help us again to seek you to fulfill our thirst. We pray that you help us to keep a heavenly view. We are seated above with Christ in the heavenlies because of what he's done for us. Lord, help us see that picture instead of just being filled with anxiety or worry because of the mess we see from underneath. Help us to trust you. And lastly, Lord, I pray any who don't know you that today is the day, today is the day of salvation. I pray they call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. And we pray this in his wonderful, perfect name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and join us in worship. You met me at my lowest moment. You saw me at my very worst. When I expected disappointment, love was all I heard. It was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. You ran to me when I was naked. You clothed me in your righteousness. You pulled me from the depths of darkness into your light again. Oh, into your light again. My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. And how deep, how wide. How far, how high is the love of my Savior, the love of Christ? How deep, how wide, how far, how high is the love of my Savior, the love of Christ? How deep, how wide, how far? My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, my guilt was great, your love was greater still. My sin was deep, your grace was deeper, my shame was wide, your arms were wider, 
My guilt was great. Your love was greater still. Your love was greater still. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. We love you guys. Have a great week. Give thanks to the Lord.